Hey, what's up? This is Vinny Caruana from The Movie Life. I am the Avalanche, peaced out, constant elevation, human shield, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. I am your host, Keith. We are coming to you today on Halloween, and I've got a terrifying, bone-chilling episode of the show. This week's guest is Chris Wren of Bridge Nine Records, and we cover it all. Bridge Nine Records, the bands, good scene stories, selling shirts outside of Fenway Park and getting into fights with Boston Red Sox fans. We cover it all. And that's coming up shortly, so strap in. Before we get to that, support the new scene. Me. Give me Apple Podcast and Spotify reviews. And please make them five stars. I mean, come on. We could use them. If you write a nice review on Apple Podcasts, I'll read it on the air. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Follow our YouTube channels. We've got a main channel with full show episodes. We've got a clips channel with pieces of our favorite episodes. And we've got a gaming channel. If you're into gaming, we do it all here at the new scene. Last but not least, shirts. Buying a new scene shirt is a great way to support the show. Head on over to Deathwish Inc., search the new scene, you'll see our fine selection of shirts. And don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. The Darling Fire have some upcoming tour dates with Zombie Apocalypse. You're really going to want to catch that show if you can. For more information, head on over to the Iodine Instagram at Iodine Recordings or check out their website at iodinerecords.com. So let's talk new music, huh? I haven't heard any brand new bands that have grabbed me recently, but a lot of familiar favorites of ours have new stuff out. Fleshwater has another new single out called The Razor's Apple, and it's very, very good. Go listen to it. This album's going to be one of the best of the year. I know it. I can tell already. Anxious have another new single out. Where You Been? I like this one even better than the last one. And by the time you listen to this, Softkill's new LP, Canary Yellow, will be out. Make sure you check it out. I'm looking forward to hearing that as well. So make sure you check back in with me in segment three. I had a really busy weekend. I went to gigs Friday Saturday and Sunday, I saw Softkill. I saw a Veil and Dead Guy. I went to the Big Iodine Show with One Line Drawing. I'm going to give you a full recap and more, but right now, we are going to speak to Chris Wren of Bridge Nine Records. Enjoy. All right, we are here now with Chris Wren. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Keith. Excited to be here. Yes, Chris, it's wonderful to have you here. You know, you've done a lot in the world of music. Bridge Nine Records, a label that everybody knows, many classic releases. You have Sully's Brand, a t-shirt company that uh, Ben Affleck and other affluent Bostoners have been seen wearing. And we're going to cover all of that. But first, Chris, let me ask you, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm, I'm, uh, I got to uh, admit I'm a little, little beat, a little, uh, little worn out. The last few months have been, uh, we've had a lot going on and a lot of, a lot of juggling, but you know, again, psyched to be here. What kind of stuff do you have going on? Are you talking family? Are you talking career? What is, what's going on? So the biggest change has been, we moved, uh, offices and, and had a, a pretty extensive renovation and build out for the place that we landed. And it's just, you know, they, they, whenever they talk about construction and, projects like this it costs twice as much and, and it takes twice as long and so i've i've been i'm typically burning the candle at both ends but i feel like i've been doing it a lot more lately yeah with construction i'm always surprised the company i work for we were moving to a new office and we got a sneak preview and it, it was like two weeks before everything was supposed to be done and i was like oh everything will pre everything will be like done by now it's it's two weeks but nothing was done yeah. furniture wasn't built the walls weren't built like they really push it to the very end and it always does cost more and take more time yeah yeah it was it was a lot but but um you know this has been a very transitional time for me and for bridge nine and for 
you know, everyone in, in my orbit just kind of, I don't know, kind of just trying to find a new way of moving forward out, you know, after the pandemic and as a label and, and now as a record store. So but we can we can get into that. So you have a record store as well? There's a storefront? There is. The um, you know, we were in a warehouse for 14 years and it was a cool space. I mean, we we built it out kind of like to our own style and design. It was in an old mill building. Um originally signed a, a, a three-year lease and we were there for 14. Um, but we were in the middle of an industrial complex that nobody knew we were there. I mean, people in the neighborhood had no idea we were there. And I think for maybe for many years, that was um, a benefit, but it just got to the point where I felt isolated. And I think that was something that I was, I kind of had more of a realization of during COVID and the, and the lockdowns and, and everything associated with the pandemic. So as I was trying to figure out where we would go after our landlord told us that they were selling the building, I wanted something that had more engagement, you know, more opportunity for connection with community. When we were in our old space, we, we'd have random events. You know, we had some bands perform in our office and we had a flea market and we had a comedy night one night. Um, but it wasn't something that it was easy to find or, you know, people would, whenever somebody would come to our old office, I would have to send them photos of the building to kind of help them narrow down, you know, where they were going. So now, you know, we're basically on a main street in the town that we moved to. Um, everybody who drives through this, this town has to drive by our building. So I think we've kind of had a drastic kind of 180 from being hidden away in an industrial complex to being right front and center. Is it exclusively Bridge Nine stuff, or do we have a little bit of everything? So it's it's uh, no, it's it's as a record store, it's everything within a few degrees of what Bridge Nine is known for. So you know, very much on the kind of punk end of the spectrum with music, but um, not specifically just Bridge Nine. And then the other side of the store. So basically, the store is split into two separate kind of retail concepts. One side is just record store and Bridge Nine and all things punk. The other side is, a, a, you mentioned it, but a company called Sully's Brand that is our kind of Boston-centric uh, sports kind of clothing brand on the other side. Ah, so we have them both in the same place. That's good. Yeah, that's the thing. We are, they both coexisted in a warehouse for you know, over 20 years, but most people didn't realize that they were the same, pl- you know, f- coming from the same place. So you know, I was meeting people that liked our bands and that wore the Sully's Brand shirts and were aware of both brands, but had no idea that they were connected. Yeah, you know, I was researching you, and you've been doing the print thing for a long time. That's almost how you got started, right? Remember the uh, the Ska sticker that you created? Yeah. I love Ska yeah. with the uh, checkered heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I must say, you know, I, I'm not really a Ska fan, but at the time, you know, I was trying to do Bridge Nine. I was putting out, you know, I was living in a, a you know, a dorm room, and I was in college, and I didn't have any extra money to put out records. So what I was doing was making things and selling them to Hot Topic to make some money to uh, to invest in putting out you know records with bands that I liked. And and that was I remember I went into a Hot Topic. My friend Matt worked at a one of the stores. He was a manager, and I think I was in town over around a holiday. And I I went to to meet up with him and go get dinner when he got out of work. And while he was closing up the store, I was just looking in their glass cases. And I mean, they had like these kind of corny subculture themed stickers <laughs> and, you know, they're selling them for like three or $4. And I was, I love just looking at them like, well, I can make those. So he got me the buyer's, you know, phone number and address. And I just started making like designing on my like, you know, computer, like designing like sticker graphics that I thought they might bite. And I sent them that one and they're like, oh yeah, we'll try this. And they ended up ordering thousands of them. And, <laughs> and that was just like that, that just kind of like opened the door. And then I started making, you know, like these, I had one that said like, uh, big brother is watching you. And it had the crime watch logo. And I mean, over the course of a year, I think they ordered like 10,000 of these stickers and I was buying them for, you know, I don't know, 20 cents a piece, selling them to them for a dollar. So the margin was, was great. And it like, I literally, I mean, I, I was making, you know, what, like six bucks, seven bucks an hour, you know, working in the computer lab twice a day, twice a week. 
at, at school. So I had no extra money. That, that was just like, like kind of just get by money. So to put out records, and I mean, at this time it was just, you know, a seven inch every other, you know, like every year or so we'd have like another seven inch come out with a band. And the only way I could afford to do that was to try and find ways to make money elsewhere and then put it into the label. So how did you decide you wanted to start doing a record label? So, you know, I was the guy that wasn't in a band. Um, all my friends were in bands or had some sort of role, right? Like when you're in high school and you're, or we, when you're in your late teens or early twenties, um, most of the people I knew were, were in bands or they did a fanzine or I had a friend that went to every show and took photos. I wanted to do something to, to stay connected to my hometown scene because I was going to school a few states away. And there was a scene in Vermont where I was going to school, but it was small and I wasn't really a part of it yet. So I wanted something to connect me back to Connecticut where I had, you know, gone to high school. And a friend of mine just said, Hey, you should put out a seven inch or like put out a record. And I had done artwork for friends, demo cassettes and helped them design t-shirts and stickers and buttons and small things, but I had never done something on that level. And they had a friend that had done that. They had a, a, these were guys from the Philly area and they had a friend, uh, this guy, Scott Byman, who did Bloodlink records. And I had some Bloodlink records in my record collection, you know, some of the releases he'd put out and they said, just give him a call. So it's actually funny because back then you couldn't just call somebody phone, like phone calls were so prohibitively expensive in the, you know, at that point that, you know, I remember like my parents, if they wanted to call somebody, they'd call them like after eight o'clock at night because it was cheaper. And if they wanted to call family, like if my mom was calling her sister, she'd call at like nine o'clock on a Sunday night because that's when it was the cheapest. So it was. Yeah. Even if, uh, even if it was a landline call, like I remember my best friend lived, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes away. And even if I called him, there was a charge. They used to charge for everything. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it was only like part of your plan, I guess, back then, if it was like in town local, but if you want to call somebody that's four states away, I mean, it, you, if you could afford to do that, you were still watching the clock as you're talking. So you're always aware of the time that, you know, that you've, that you're kind of on the call. So the ability to communicate was restricted, but back then there was a workaround and this guy, Scott, he was actually part of it. Somebody, and I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but somebody had figured out that if you took a phone dialer that you could convert it to kind of like hack it, I guess, to allow yourself to make free phone calls with pay phones. Have you ever heard? I've heard of these. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, a lot of the guys in Philly, like I know Robbie Redcheeks had them and might have been selling them and, and, and Scott Bivin uh, had them as well. And basically in the nineties and and prior to that, if you were somebody that traveled a lot, if you were a, a traveling salesperson and you needed to use pay phones a lot, you could buy one of these Radio Shack dialers. And basically what it allowed you to do is to type in and save your credit card numbers. So when you would make a phone call, you, it would, you know, it would ask you for your credit card. And instead of punching in 20 digits or so, you would just press one button and then hold this little microphone up to the, the phone. And it would recognize the, the numbers that you were punching in. It actually looked like a little keypad with a microphone on one side. And so basically the phone would make a noise, you know, you, you know, the, when you press a button, you hear that number kind of noise. Well, the phone internally also um, makes a noise when money is put in. So when you put a quarter in, there's like some sort of sound inside the phone so that the phone recognizes, oh, a quarter was just deposited. And somebody figured out that if you tweak the dialer, you could get it to instead of making the tone that you know, you just pressed number five, that it made the tone that a quarter was just dropped in. And basically these were, these were sold to a lot of people in, in punk bands and you could make free phone calls from, from pay phones. And so I called Scott with one of these dialers that he had provided to my friend and was able to just, you know, kind of pick his brain a little bit and get some direction as to how I was going to put out a record. And he didn't know who I was. I basically said, Hey, my friend, Mark, you know, gave me your number. And I know he's friends with your brother. Like I was, you know, and I basically told him what I wanted to do. And he was, he was pretty cool and gave me the, you know, the right direction, I guess. 
to get started. Isn't that what's great about the scene is just people helping out people, even if you don't know each other. And I did this a lot more when I was younger, but like if someone was down, I was just willing to help them out. Like I remember picking up some kid at Trenton train station who I didn't even know. And we drove all the way up to Syracuse for Hellfest. It was just like, yeah, just be here. I'll come pick you up. It was just like, it's just like a community. Yeah. I mean, well, when you don't have a lot of other people in the greater community at large willing to have your back, you kind of need to reinforce it on a, on a, on like that kind of subculture level. Absolutely. So what did you learn? On the phone call? I mean, I, I learned, okay. So he said, you're going to want to get your records pressed at, you know, this pressing plant because it's the most cost effective and you're going to need covers, but don't worry, you can get them printed at this kind of print shop, like something local. It doesn't have to be a specialty printer. And he said, when you get the records, you're going to want to get them to distributors. So you should check out and, you know, he listed off maybe four or five different places and said, you know, make sure you grab this fanzine and get listed off a couple of titles and said, they usually have good advertisements for places that'll carry records. Um, so that helped me get a little bit of direction because remember, like putting out a record uh, to somebody who's never done it before is like this kind of really abstract uh, concept. And you you can boil it down to very specific parts, but when you've never thought of it before, really, it sounds crazy and it sounds like a much bigger thing than it is. So by talking to him, it gave me some direction, but it also gave me confidence that, all right, this is something that, you know, he's doing, he's done it a bunch of times. Um, there's other people clearly that are doing it. So um, I'm not reinventing the wheel, but I can kind of find a way to do it, do it my own way, I guess. Yeah, I love that. It's funny with anything you get involved in, there's everything is already set up. You just have to tap into that, you know, but before you don't know until you know. Yeah. Yeah. Just it's just a matter of trying and starting. Exactly. So what was the first seven inch you put out? So the first seven inch was a band called Tenfold, who the members I went to my high school in um in this town called Glastonbury, Connecticut. And the it was a split seven inch with another band called Some of All Fears who they were, uh, yes. they were friends with. I didn't know, I hadn't met the band yet when we um, first started talking about it, but they, uh, you know, they connected me with them. So you're starting to put out seven inches. You're doing stickers on the side. How does this thing start to take off more? So it was really just one record a year, very kind of limited resources. So I would have to press a record, sell it until I could recoup enough that I could do it again. And for me at the time, that was basically one record a year until I could afford to do another one. I think after a few years, I did two records. And then around the fall of 99, that's when I ended up becoming roommates with a couple of the guys that were in American Nightmare. And they were the first band that was really willing to just drop everything and tour. Most of the bands I'd worked with prior to that would just play really local shows. So um, that was an opportunity to finally have a band that was that was willing to to do a lot. So once we kind of linked up and agreed to do a record together, you know, I had a few other things that had to kind of fall into place, but that really helped kind of put Bridge Nine as a label on the map. Yeah, because American Nightmare, you know, I remember from the earliest mentions of that band, a lot of excitement, a lot of hype. Yeah, you know, they it was a transitional time. There, a lot of the the bands that they were, you know, friendly with, um, were all breaking up around that time. And it was kind of, kind of a new, you know, there was kind of a void that was being opened. And I think there was a lot of anticipation for what they could do as a band. I mean, I remember going, I went with them to Europe for their first European tour. And I mean, the kids there were just so excited for them to come over in a way. And it was communicated to me that, that it was not typical. You know, people, I mean, other American bands had come, come and gone on tours, but everyone was really excited for them to come. So it was, it was cool to be a part of that at that moment. That's awesome. Yeah. And I had Wes on the show recently and he mentioned that, that, you know, the other bands that they had run with or had been fans of had broken up. So there was kind of a void for a, uh, traditional sounding hardcore band. I mean, there was a lot of metallic stuff going on and they filled that void and then some. They did. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, and it was just, uh, you know, it was a little different than what had come before them at the time. So it was just the, you know, things were changing and, and they were, I don't know, kind of able to direct the narrative in terms of music and, and that kind of scene. So you put out that seven inch, I'm sure that sold very well, right? Yeah, that was, that was our first record. Um, 
with with American Nightmare. It was our seventh release. It was our first release that was carried through a, a national distributor. Um, prior to that, everything was just, you know, I would call up a distributor and they would say, yeah, send me 10 copies, send me 20 copies. And um, so it was very spotty in terms of availability. Probably the way that most people got our releases back then were just, was probably just mail order, you know, people writing to me and, and sending me, you know, $4 in an envelope and me throwing it in the mail, and, you know, from my, from my college dorm. Um, but when we started, when I started working with American Nightmare, uh, their release was the first through Lumberjack distribution, who was kind of a big indie distributor at the time. So they were able to ensure that the record was available, you know, nationwide, um, which was a first, a first for me. So what happens? Do they call and say, like, give me 3000 and then you have to figure out how to get that done? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't those quantities at first. It was only a seven inch and like a, like a, I think it was a six song, seven inch and a seven song CD. So it wasn't considered an album and albums were what, we're getting more placement in record stores, but it was something where instead of just pressing, you know, I think every record prior to that, we had pressed a thousand copies and that was pretty much it. And then this record we pressed multiple times. I mean, I, I don't know if I can't remember offhand, but it was probably, you know, two or 3000 copies over the first year, which, and which was actually uh, difficult because uh, if you, I don't know if you have seen the, or if you recall the record, but it had this band that was kind of this printed band that kind of, went around the record. And then instead of the record opening at the top or the side, it opened in the center. And every one of those had to be glued by hand, and it, which I did. So I, I had to hand glue every single one. And um, so that kind of that kind of slowed down the process with, with, with respect to the vinyl. I mean, the CD was kind of like a standard jewel case CD, but for the vinyl, every single one was basically hand glued in my apartment. And I had to, like, I had this process where I would like fold it over the record put Elmer's glue on like the little tab and then close it shut with a, like a, one of those black kind of clips, binder clips. And I just, I would have those all over my room, you know, on every, <laughs> every flat surface. Um, so that was, that was a process, but it was a cool detail. I mean, I was, I was, I was cursing, you know, it, it as like a design element at the time, but you know, I'm, I'm psyched that it turned out the way it did. Do you still see that record in your nightmares just all over your room? No, no. I mean, it's, it's one <laughs> of those things that it's aged well. I mean, it's, you know, now it's like, I look back fondly at those kind of those, those times, but at the moment, I mean, it's like two in the morning and I'm trying, you know, trying to get these done so I can have them for the, you know, the tour starting that week or for the distributor that needs them. So yeah, it was, it was a little bit of a speed bump, but we got through it. I bet you never did a layout like that again. No, that was the only one that was, <laughs> I, I learned my lesson. You were, so we have the American Nightmare seven inch out. Now you said up until that point, you're doing one record a year and it sounds pretty self-contained. You put out the record, you sell that record, and then we have funds to put out another record. Yep. When did that gap start closing? Did it turn into like three records a year, four records a year? So the year we put out, or the, the year that I put out the American Nightmare first seven inch, I had three releases. So that was, you know, that was an increase. Um, the year after that, I had a dozen and then 13 the year after that, 14 the year after that, like 20 the year after that. So things really snowballed very quickly in great part. I mean, American Nightmare was a huge driver um, and ambassador, right? Like they're out there. Um, I was go. I went to all their early shows. I was, I went to their first West coast tour. I went, you know, to the first European tour so I had the opportunity to connect with people all over in a way that I hadn't been able to prior to that because people in bands, they're touring a lot. They're meeting people all over the place. You know, I, as somebody that wasn't in a band prior to this, I was kind of stuck in my kind of like New England kind of area that I would go to shows, you know, kind of go to shows in. But with American Nightmare, they were touring quite a bit. So it really helped spread the word about Bridge Nine. Um, I was able to put a, just a lot of resources into the band at the time because for me, it wasn't just about having a really good band. Um, I also needed the resources because the label is basically like the bank for the band. You know, the, the label uh, has to figure out how to pay for all the stuff, um, pay for the recording, pay for the, you know, the promotion of the record. You know, if there's uh, a push at 
you know, back then it was a push at radio or there's like magazine ads. Um, you got to figure out how to make all that stuff happen. And, you know, selling bumper stickers to Hot Topic was cool and it helped me put out a seven inch here and there, but it wasn't that kind of resources that I needed. So in the spring of 2000, actually Wes from American Nightmare and a bunch of friends, um, we all went down to Fenway Park because we were living less than a mile, I think, from Fenway Park where the Red Sox play. And we started selling stuff that kind of riffed on the rivalry with the Yankees. You know, Yankee suck was like obviously the the kind of most popular slogan of the, the late 90s into early 2000s in Boston. I mean, you would hear that chanted at every single game. It didn't matter if the, if the Yankees were playing. I mean, I remember I went to OzFest and there was people chanting Yankee suck. You know, like, like <laughs> it just, it was a ubiquitous thing. And so in the same way I was uh, taking things um, and putting them on bumper stickers and selling them to Hot Topic, I started doing that with things that were relevant to Red Sox fans. And we just crushed it. I mean, just made so much money. Um, for, you know, it, it was like, it was wild. I mean, we would go down to Fenway Park with these backpacks full of stickers and buttons and pins and then, and then t-shirts and just like sell this stuff hand over fist and then take all that money and put it into putting out records, you know, use it to pay for studio bills, pay for print advertisements, posters, basically everything that you need to do on the label side. And basically just put the, like the um, engine of, of resources that, that we, you need to put out to kind of support that, that number of records we're, we were able to come up with. Um, so that's how I was kind of, I was able to ramp the label up. Amazing. Yeah. You know, I like um, Boston sounds similar to Philly and the, just the sport. I'm not into sports, but the sports rivalry stuff is so funny, just like the passion and the, the ball breaking and all that. And I guess with Philly, we would say the Yankees suck too. Which is, I mean, which is why it was so popular because, you know, when we would be selling this, we would be selling stuff that said Yankees suck at every single game, right? So there's the Yankees aren't playing in Massachusetts or in Boston, <laughs> but like we would have, a, we would have uh, two teams. I mean, the Red Sox and whoever came into town who also hated the Yankees. So the, uh, emphasis on on Yankee suck and like the you know when the Yankees played obviously it was a big deal but half the half the audience isn't going to buy it but if you have like the, you know the Mets randomly play and you know with the Red Sox or somebody you know that also like Seattle that like also hates the Yankees you know you've got you've got a like the entire stadium is interested so it was a I love that yeah it was it was a it was a great market and for us I mean it was cool because historically Boston so Boston had uh, a really cool club right around the corner from Fenway Park called the Rat. And that was where a lot of Boston hardcore bands got their got their start. And fans, you know, hanging out before matinees or during matinee shows would all like get into altercations with Red Sox fans because, you know, let's say a Red Sox day game would get out and the, the whole, I mean, when the game gets out, it's a whole wave. Like it's like a 40 minute wave of people coming out. And at first it's just the sidewalk you know, with hundreds of people coming out and then the entire street gets taken over by people leaving. And there would be altercations between punks and sports fans in front of the rat. And for, for us, and now the rat left in 97. So, you know, that building was torn down, unfortunately, and they put up a hotel, but the punks were able to still kind of congregate in that area. But instead of, you know, being, you know, at the mercy and, and getting in altercations with, with Red Sox fans, we had kind of figured out a way to monetize the situation and now have Red Sox fans, instead of coming at us with these little mini souvenir bats that they would you know, buy in the souvenir store and end up hitting punks with, we were able to kind of be out there and, uh, and sell them things. I mean, I, you'd have people coming up and like, I, give me one of everything. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> <you know. laughs> I mean, did anything crazy ever happen down there? You're dealing with wild, probably drunk sports fans. Oh, yeah. uh, you're handling cash and selling stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, so just for example, those, so those mini bats, I mean, if you're a, re if you're a baseball fan, you're familiar with those little 18 inch baseball bats that have the name of the team kind of yep. uh, written on them or you're know, carved, you know, kind of engraved on them. So fans would leave and, and, and fights would break out with those in the eighties. 
And most of the, most of the kind of, uh, the issues that we had leave with people leaving games, it wasn't, it wasn't Yankees fans being pissed off that we were talking shit on their team. It was drunken Red Sox fans that were angry because the Red Sox lost again, or, you know, because they didn't like the look of the guys that were, you know, the people that were, the people that were selling the stuff, you know, a lot of, a lot of people were heavily tattooed, you know, they, they, it, there was kind of a culture clash between sports fans and, and kind of hardcore punk fans. And most of the time they were really excited to just give us their money and buy something and, and go, be on their way. But, you know, I mean, if, if the Red Sox just lost and somebody has been pounding beers all day, they're, they're looking for trouble on their way out. And so we would have to, you know, people would try and steal from us all the time. People would just walk by, grab something off the side of our cart. And we would kind of have to leave our, our, our merchandise kind of kind of open so that it was easy for us to access so we could do transactions very quickly. But it also kind of opened it up to other people that if they wanted to steal from you. And at first we would, you know, defend our stuff. We would go chase the people and, and get in fights. Um, but then you realize, well, fuck, I mean, just let the $10 shirt go because otherwise now all of a sudden the police are involved or there's, you know, uh, you, everyone had to run basically because somebody, you know, got hit, you know, kind of thing. So we didn't want to be a part of that and just kind of had to um, kind of change how we existed around the park. Um, I think early on, we were really excited to just be like, oh, fuck it. Like, you know, they're stealing from us. Let's, let's uh, protect what we're doing. And some of the, some crazy stuff definitely happened back then. But I mean, and we're also talking, this is 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. But uh, yeah, after a while, things started to chill out and we realized, you know what, if somebody's just going to grab something, just, I don't know. Just it's cost of doing business. It's overhead. Yeah. I'm interested. Talk about, I mean, you go from three releases in a year to 12, I think you said the next year. Now, talk about that time because this is the best time. You know, you're doing this thing and you're getting by putting out records here or there, but it must have exploded then. Like, what was it like? How did you feel? You know, so it wasn't, so I had a band with American Nightmare that was willing to drop everything a tour. I had what felt like unlimited resources with the opportunity that we had selling merchandise to, you know, to baseball fans. But at that time, I also started working at another record label called Big Wheel Recreation. And, you know, Big Wheel was at the time, I mean, this, you know, 2000 uh, was the label in Boston. They were doing stuff with like Jimmy World and Piebald and like, they just, they were a hardcore label, but they were doing all sorts of kind of indie stuff and they, you couldn't pigeonhole them. And so I was working there and really kind of learning the, the trade, right? Like the, you know, in the same way that when I spoke with Scott, he was able to kind of give me, um, feedback on how to get started. Uh, Rama at Big Wheel gave me the opportunity to, to just be a sounding board. And he had probably put, I don't know, put out 30 or 40 releases and which seemed like just this insane amount of, of stuff at the time. And, and he had, dealt with all sorts of headaches with getting his label started. So it allowed me to kind of uh, fast track a few things. And so through my uh, working with him, I I was able to get distribution through Lumberjack, which allowed the American Nightmare record to be everywhere. And in that first year of working with Big Wheel and having American Nightmare be kind of an ambassador for the label, I was able to put all these resources into the band and I think at the time, other bands saw what I was able to do with American Nightmare, other labels that would traditionally have jumped on a band like American Nightmare or other bands that were they were touring with were just kind of suddenly no longer signing hardcore bands. Um, so there was a void for me to be able to step in. And kind of in the same way American Nightmare was able to step into a void, I was able to step into something where, you know, maybe Revelation or Equal Vision would have signed these bands um, that I was starting to work with. Uh, if it was maybe five years earlier, but right now they weren't. So it allowed me at, for one moment to be able to sign any band that I wanted to that kind of existed in that world. Yeah. And I mean, Bridge Nine, when I think 2000s hardcore, kings of hardcore, I think Bridge Nine first and foremost. That's cool. Thank you. I mean, thankfully we, we've we been able to... So the label now, I've been doing it for, t- for 27 years. Um, I know a lot of labels boil down to specific moments, I think. 
Um, with us, I think we've been able to fortunately stretch that out over long, longer periods of time. But there are a lot of people that when they think of Bridge Nine, they think of what was happening in Boston in you know, the early 2000s. Right. That's how you got on my radar. And I think it was uh, like the more traditional hardcore, you know what I mean? And I didn't listen to a lot of that at the time. But when I thought of like people that really scare me and the real hardcore they listen to, I thought of Bridge Nine. Well, I mean, at the time we were working with you know bands like Death Threat from Connecticut. We had that first early record with The Hope Conspiracy. Um, yep. you know, panic in Boston, uh, carry on on the West coast, you know, and then later terror, um, you know, after carry on broke up, I mean, there was, we were, I was very lucky and very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time with a lot of really exciting bands. Yeah. That's what I think it is. I think it's right place, right time, drive and talent. If you have, if all of those intersect, then big things happen. Yeah. And how lucky are you that the first band you have on your label who really wants to tour is American Nightmare? That's like a once in a lifetime shot. And the funny thing is, it's you don't always recognize it at the moment. I mean, I wasn't trying. I mean, they were just my friends. It was and and, and we approached doing that first record in the same way I had approached the previous five or six releases. Like, I'm friends with you guys. I've I like your you know, I, I like what you're trying to do. Let's just put out a record. You know, I mean, the demo that American Nightmare put out wasn't the best sounding demo. It was kind of hard to uh, judge them as a band based on that, I felt like at the time. But their live set was crazy. So very quickly, it's like, let's let's do this. So their first, I think their first show was in February of 2000. And they were in the studio by April, I think. And I'd had a chance to see them and knew that whatever they did was going to be cool. When they signed with Equal Vision and put out those records, were you upset or were you mature enough to be like, all right, we had our time. It's time for them to move on. So I I wasn't upset because there, I, do, I couldn't give the band what they needed. And I, I was able, ah. yeah, I was able to recognize that, that, you know, my, whatever limitations that I had, because remember, I was doing this out of a bedroom when I worked with American Nightmare. I had very little resources in the grand scheme. I mean, the, the opportunity at Fenway was great, but I, it was being split, uh, you know, at this point amongst a ton of different bands. So um, I couldn't give any one band the uh, the push that a, a label like Equal Vision could give. So, and I always liked Equal Vision. I mean, they were, they were a label that helped distribute some of our early t-shirts in the 90s. So I had a uh, connection with them. You know, I was a big fan and friends with Ten Yard Fight and they had worked with Equal Vision. So I was psyched to see the band continue to grow. And I think at the time it was, uh, I just felt proud that I was a part of the equation that got them to that point because Equal Vision didn't sign them off the bat originally. So it was nice to be able to say, look, you miss, you're missing out. Like this, this band is really something special. So when did you move out of your bedroom and into a bigger space in, in terms of running the label? So in 2001, I had maybe a dozen releases out at the time. I moved my label into a space in Boston across from Fenway Park that was called Inatech. Um, it was the, uh, the, uh, it was kind of the Rama from Big Wheel. He was, he was kind of the mastermind from what I remember of this space where it was, there was multiple labels that were all being run out of bedrooms. I mean, I only had a handful of releases out and I was doing it out of the bedroom, but Big Wheel Recreation, you know, a label that was like doing really cool big things. Um, was out of a loft apartment and Hydrahead Records, who has also done very cool and amazing things at that time, was being run out of a Mission Hill apartment, you know, a few streets away from where I was living. But, you know, they had basically converted this brownstone apartment into like a label headquarters. And it was, you know, stacks of records in what used to be a living room. So it, it didn't really lend itself well to being not to say a professional environment, but one where you could kind of do the day-to-day -day needs of running a label out of, you know, cause yeah. it, it you're, you're living in the same space that you're working and everyone in that equation wanted to do something where they had some separation between their house and, and their work. And this space that became, they jokingly called it in out of the office, you know, office space movie kind of reference because it was like, I mean, it was a, it was a shitty little space. I mean, it was awesome. We loved it, but it was a, subterranean basement underneath the Domino's pizza, you know, on, on like a right across from Fenway park, but it, it had no windows. It had, you know, it got too hot, uh, in the, in the summer, but it was 
uh, like all of ours, you know, they started it. Um, and I was just an employee of big wheel when it, when they first started. Um, but very quickly I went from, you know, having, you know, all these releases, I couldn't do both. So I, after a year of working with big wheel asked, Hey, would you guys mind if I step down from my job, but start paying rent, uh, in this space? And they were cool with that. So I basically started running the label out of this corner of this, this office. And I mean, this, there's three labels packed into something that was, I don't know, maybe 1600 square feet. So it was, it was still a tight little space, but everyone went from being in their own homes, kind of working in their own space without a lot of interaction with other people to now being in this kind of very vibrant, uh, you know, office that has all sorts of people that are really excited about what they're involved in. So you, now you had multiple sounding boards, you had other, I mean, that the, the momentum that each label kind of had at the time was um, carrying over to each person that was there. So it was almost kind of this infectious, exciting moment. Yeah, it's gotta be. I mean, you're out of your bedroom, you have a legitimate office space now, and not only that, you're there with Big Wheel Recreation who's huge, and Hydrahead, who's huge. Everyone is doing amazing things in their own world, and you're there as well. Well, and they had done a lot of really cool things. They had also made a lot of mistakes. They had learned a lot of things. And so it gave me an opportunity to, to learn from them and put, you know, kind of take those lessons and, uh, and apply them to what I was trying to do with Bridge Nine. You know, because you with with running a record label, there's you know, it's not something you can really buy a book and figure out how to do it. And you're certainly not taking a class on it. I mean, maybe now you can, I don't know at the time that, that didn't exist. So like you really uh, almost kind of had to apprentice on some level, like, you know, like you were becoming a tattoo artist, like you had to kind of go in there and absorb things uh, around other people that were already doing it. I felt that was the, the fastest way to get your bearings and and learn how to do it properly. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, it just sounds like it all happened organically. And I say it all the time, but th- that's how great things happen. You know, it just all came together, right place, right time, right people. Your friends are in bands doing things. You have the drive to figure this all out and it all led here. Yeah, that's that was it. It was, it was multiple things happening in concert. Let's talk about the rise of the label. I mean, we've got 13 releases out now. We've got American Nightmare out on tour. I guess at this point, other bands are interested. Is it getting easier to sign other bands or make offers to other bands and they're interested? Yeah. At that time, I mean, 2001, 2002, 2003, I, really any band that I wanted to work with, I was able to uh, figure out a way to, to have that opportunity. So it was it was a very cool time. I mean, I, you know, everything that I was earning, all the money that I was earning from, you know, the opportunity at, at, at Fenway Park was kind of underwriting a lot of this. And it just, it seemed like anything I really wanted to do, I was able to figure out a way to do it. So it was, it was definitely cool. You know, that's funny. Now that I think about it, your office is across from Fenway Park. So it's like, let me go down here and run the label. Oh, I need money. Let me (laughs) grab all my Yankee suck shirts, go upstairs sell them and then bring it back downstairs to run the label. It's uh, everything is right next to each other. It's perfect. It was blocks away. It was so cool. I mean, basically, you know, I would do label stuff until five o'clock, six o'clock. And then all the people that would sell this stuff with me would roll into the office and we would pack everything up and we would leave as a group and kind of work our way around the side of the park because there was code enforcement police that were kind of, that were hired as a detail by Fenway Park to keep vendors uh, and street peddlers as kind of what we were um, moving in, in, a, in a way. So we'd kind of have to sneak up around the back of the park and, and wait till the game got out and then just kind of rush the streets, um, sell as much stuff as we could and kind of pull back and meet back at the office. So that was kind of like our every every night during the baseball season. Amazing. And it's great that you had friends to actually help you do it too. Yeah. Those are real friends. And it will most of the, you know, it, it was, it was also a great opportunity. I mean, remember, you know, at, at the time, if a lot of the people that were working with me were people in bands, people that couldn't have traditional jobs because that they were trying to tour. So, you know, and for me, the, the first time, I mean, at, in the summer of 2000, um, maybe it was just before that I, I was making at my day job, like, I don't know, 250 bucks a week. I made like 400 bucks my first night selling stuff outside of Fenway. So like it was, 
drastically the 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 scale of of you know I was working I don't know 30 hours a week pulling in you know making 250 bucks and now I was working 3 hours and making almost double that um so that was very eye eye opening you know on one level um but it was also an opportunity where a lot of the guys and a lot of the people that were selling for me you know both men and women there th- we were they were coming you know they were making 100 bucks 200 bucks sometimes at night and so they were doing really well for themselves. I mean, it was, it was, it was, uh, um, an opportunity where all of a sudden everybody in our circle was making a lot of money. You know, there was the people, there was, there was us that were kind of the top kind of making this stuff. And, and then there were the people that were, you know, that were our friends or I had interns where it's like, Hey, I can't pay you to work at bridge nine, but I can bring you in on this opportunity at Fenway and you'll be able to make money that way, which was kind of a cool way for people to, to be a part of it and, and kind of help allow us to kind of keep pushing things along. How long were you in that space for? I think we were there from 2001 till about 2003. So we're, we were only in that space for about two years. Then that building was sold. The, that whole side of the street that we were on right, o- right opposite Fenway Park, no building went above two stories for generations. And then they sold, they, they, one by one, the buildings on that street were sold and torn down. And then these 14 story buildings, you know, were, were, were put up in their place. So we were bumped out of there at the time I, I had moved the label to Salem, Massachusetts and shared an office space with death wish. And we did that for about four years. So I, I, uh, I moved the label to, uh, to Salem, but then I moved the sports kind of, uh, merchandise opportunity down the street and just took over a, a band rehearsal space uh, in another building that was, you know, destined to be torn down, but still had a few years left before it got there. Bridge Nine was a huge hardcore label at a time when violence was running rampant in the scene. There was a lot of gang activity, a lot of crazy stuff going on. How did you feel during all of that? I mean, you have this label, you have bands out playing these shows, you have tons of kids coming to see these bands. How did you feel during all of this? So I was never a fan of, of, the, of any sort of gang violence, you know, I mean, cause we're, we're part of a community and there's seeing separation with inside that community and also seeing, you know, people being hurt because of really random beefs was never cool. And, you know, unfortunately it's, it is part of uh, the equation when it comes to hardcore and punk. I mean, you're dealing with a lot of, uh, there's a lot of damaged people that are that are drawn to hardcore and punk. I mean, a lot of very great creative people, but there's also people, you know, that that have had I don't know whatever kind of upbringing that um, allows for some of that to kind of be an okay part of resolving conflicts. So you know, I I don't know. I it, it's on one level it was it was just something that kind of existed and you just kind of dealt with it. Um, but I never wanted to necessarily endorse that or be a part of that. You know, we had, we had, we worked with bands that, that kind of existed in that world and, and had, you know, feet in that world. Um, but kind of, I don't know, you, you couldn't always judge every book by its cover. And, you know, just because a, a band had members that were kind of either affiliated with organizations or like, we're just a part of that world. It, it was, um, it was just, so, it was just part of, uh, I think, hardcore and punk at that time. I mean, certainly in Boston, but but elsewhere as well. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, there's people I can think of who I know no one wants to mess with them or didn't want to mess with them. But to me, I'm like, well, well, they've always been nice to me. Yeah. I haven't really experienced anything personally. So there's that piece of it. And back in the day, there was, at least in Philly, there was a division of hardcore. Like uh, if you were into more metallic crossover stuff, that was considered not real hardcore. And I think a lot of the stuff happening on Bridge Nine or like the New York hardcore stuff, that would be considered real hardcore. So I would kind of stay away from the quote unquote real hardcore because I knew shit was going to go down at those shows and I didn't want to be anywhere near it. Which is kind of wild how, I mean, I remember being at a at a show in Connecticut in the mid 90s and it was, uh, I think there was a hardcore matinee and like a punk show that night. And I mean, we're talking, we're one degree of separation away, right? In sound, but on yeah. one side of the street, it was just all hardcore kids and, you know, in their kind of uniform of uh, cut off cargo short, like camo shorts and, and champion sweatshirts. And then the <laughs> other side of the street was just kids with mohawks and, you know, canvas patches sewn onto their jack, you know, their kind of, 
you know, jackets. And it's crazy that there, that, that separation exists when, I mean, we're really, we're, we're so close on, on so many levels, um, compared to the rest of the world. But, you know, I, I think that's hopefully less of a thing now. I think that, you know, there's, there's more acceptance. There's more people are more open to other stuff and, and not being so narrowly focused. I don't think it's just because I'm older now and I'm not going to as many shows. It just doesn't seem like as much of a thing. Like back in the day, it was hardcore kids versus everybody. Hardcore kids versus each other. Hardcore kids versus metal kids. Hardcore kids versus uh, people who come to the show and don't know what's going on. And now I go to a show and it's just kind of everybody. You know, there, there doesn't seem to be these divisions unless I'm just completely missing out on it. You know, and I think that's cool. I think that it's better. Um, I think there's a lot of cool things that I probably missed out on because I was so narrowly focused myself as a teenager. Um, and yeah. in my early twenties where I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm really only this sort of thing. And, and, um, I don't know. I think that, I think ultimately anyone that approaches life or stuff that they're into that way loses. So I've learned to, to kind of be a lot more open-minded and I, I think that's just more generally accepted now. Yeah, same here. I was completely narrow-minded. I only listened to like a few bands and they all had to sound like each other. And if anything fell outside of that, it was dumb or like I, I was just super narrow-minded. I'm not like that anymore and I'm glad. And I don't know, I think a lot of people that get into the scene are like that at first. It's just something that kind of happens for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So as the label is blowing up and you're putting out these releases and signing all of these classic bands, are you still into the music? Is this primarily what you listen to and what you're going to see? Yeah. So, you know, when I first started, I was just putting out records with my friends' bands. And then yeah. it became records with people that I met on tour and with my friends' bands. And you kind of just go a degree of separation out. It got to the point where now I was signing bands that... I hadn't met originally, but somebody who worked with me had met or knew. And, you know, like Have Heart was a great example. Um, I had been given their demo and hadn't even really listened to it at first. I'd seen them, but like didn't really know them that well. And then uh, this guy, Aaron, who worked for me was like, you really need to listen to that demo because this band is cool. And I, so I, I finally sat down, but I needed him to kind of, kind of push me because at the time I was probably, you know, now I was in my thirties and it, I wasn't the guy that was in the van every weekend like I had been. Yeah, like when you're doing all the work, you're busy with that, and you're probably inundated every day with people who want you to hear things. And you know, I know at least that's the case for me. I, I get sent a lot of stuff, and I'm just, I just don't have time to listen to it at all. And a lot of times, I have every intention of wanting to, but you're right. We have this finite amount of space and time to deal with things, and and uh, yeah, and things get bumped. So when you finally did listen to Have Heart. I mean, oh, I mean, it was it was awesome, and it was everything that I wanted in a band at, at that time. So you know, I was excited to be a part of of their journey from you know basically their their first album. How do you judge whether you want to put something out? I mean, there's there's obvious things like does the band tour? Is this going to be a loss because they're not that active? All that kind of stuff. But when you listen to the music, how do you know? So for me, it's a matter of just having to. First, you just have to like the record or you have to like the band or just be aware of the potential that they have. And, you know, then it's a matter of like, all right, do I have, you know, I, am I in a position to do something? Um, as a label, the number of resources that you have ebbs and flows depending on what you're al also already working on. So there are times where I will sign a band that's not really active, but I really like them. Um, and I want to put the record out, but then there are times where things are tighter and I just can't do it. So I have to focus on artists that are willing to just drop everything and tour. When did you see things start to shift in the scene? I mean, I know they did. I don't know what happened exactly. Cause there's a lot of years where I was just kind of blacked out, but you know, we had a big hardcore push. And then it moved, maybe it moved back to more metallic stuff. I'm not sure. Did Were you privy to any of this? Did you see it? You know, I probably missed some of it. I know for me as a label, a label is an organic thing that grows and changes, uh, usually because whoever's running the label is growing and changing. And, you know, for me, I was, when I was the person in the van, I was putting out all these records with these very fast hardcore punk bands. And that's what I loved. 
And then as I, as I, you know, started to open myself up to other bands and other styles that I was excited about, like I always wanted to, I mean, Bridge Nine is first and foremost, a, a kind of a hardcore punk record label, but it, it's not always, it doesn't, it doesn't always sound like it because sometimes I would look for bands that had members that were very rooted in hardcore and punk, but they were trying to do something a little bit outside of the box. So for me, I think it was maybe in the later 2000s, you know, I would, you know, I think initially it was a band like Crime and Stereo where they're, they're a hardcore band, but they were more melodic, you know, or a band like Ambitions from Connecticut. You know, we even, we did some stuff with Newfound Glory and then Polar Bear Club and, you know, Lemuria, Strike Anywhere. You know, we kind of started to branch out a, a little bit in terms of our sound, but we're really only talking a degree of separation. It's not a, not a drastic uh, change, but at the time, it, it, some people felt like it was because we had very religiously focused on more traditional hardcore and punk. Did you deal with a lot of gatekeeping, putting out something like Newfound Glory? And I think you did a, a Chad from Newfound Glory's band as well. Did you deal with any flack or gatekeeping in the hardcore community? There was a little bit. There was, you know, there was definitely people that came out of the woodwork being like, you know, what, what the fuck with, you know, why is Bridge and I doing this? But because Newfound Glory was a uh, more, you know, obviously a more pop punk band that was on a major label, but everyone in the band are are hardcore punk fans that kind of come from this a uh, very similar background and interest. So for me, it was just a very incredibly cool opportunity to to work with a band that had, you know, this this level of awareness in terms of you know people being fans of them. But you know, when we put out our first record with them, they they had a Gorilla Biscuits cover. You know, they were they were doing things that were kind of paying tribute to hardcore and punk. And for us, like it, that was an opportunity to just really kind of take the label to another level because we had all of a sudden this incredible amount of interest in what we were doing. And I remember that record came out, it was one of our first releases that year in 2008. Uh, we did this tip of the iceberg EP with a newfound glory. And then a month later we put out H2O's nothing to prove album. And then I think the next month it was half hearts songs to scream at the sun. And then we did a, an album with verse the month after that. And then ceremony the month after that. So that's a big it year. Was a, it was a, it was a, we had a lot of heavy hitters that year. It was very cool. But what was r really cool was all of these people that were newfound glory fans came into kind of our universe and didn't just stay for newfound glory and then leave. They stayed for have heart. They stayed for verse and ceremony and, and H2O like, the everything lifted for years after that. It was, I mean, our reach, you know, our like our record sales, everything just lifted up. And it was very cool because you, we felt like we had this kind of, you always need to bring new people in, right? I mean, gatekeeping just, you, if you do that, you die because you're just preaching to the converted. You know, we always looked for opportunities as a label to, to basically say to somebody like, I think of myself as when I'm 15, when I was 15 and had a skateboard, like, how do you reach that person? Right. How do you, you know, find somebody that's looking to do some, you know, like looking to, to find something cool. And if you just hide yourself or you, you decide who's allowed to be a part of that community or be a part of this equation, I, I didn't, that, that wasn't, that didn't sit well with me. So we would look for opportunities to reach people. And, you know, whether it was, uh, advertising in, in, you know, uh, Matt more like kind of more mainstream magazines, like alternative press, or, you know, some of the, you know, just looking for, for like ways that we could reach people that we could kind of bring in and newfound glory was crazy. I mean, like all sorts of people that never would have listened to whether it was have heart or ceremony or verse, you know, at that time jumped on board and, and uh, it was very cool. It sounds pretty massive. That's a huge year. We have a lot of huge bands putting out classic records. How do you move away from that and then move into starting Soli's brand? And Bridge Nine is still active, of, of course. You're still putting out great records, but I don't think you're putting out 15 releases a year still, right? We did for quite a while. I mean, we I was probably putting out over a dozen releases a year till maybe about six, seven or eight years ago. So oh, really? yeah. So I mean we we still had a lot going on. Um Sully's 
was so basically the opportunity that we had at you know with baseball fans after a couple of years realized wait this is actually a better business than putting out punk records so <laughs> you know we're like how we it's we, it can no longer just be a means to an end you know like this is something that we've kind of uh recognized uh, a very excited fan base for what we're doing with sports stuff like let's kind of figure out a way to make it will, you know, take what we've learned with turning bridge nine into it's, you know, a label and kind of focus on building Sully's as a brand. So in the, I think it was 2003 was when I, when Sully's became Sully's. So, you know, it came up with the name, uh, started branding, uh, merchandise with the, with the name Sully's, uh, prior to that, there was no branding attempt. Um, it was just stuff that we just made and put it out there. But we weren't the only people trying to do that. And, and as we became successful, other people tried to kind of copy the style that we were doing. So we wanted to set ourselves apart. So I started, instead of putting 100% of the money that I was making with sports fans into the label, I started reinvesting it into what became Sully's brand. So I started taking out advertisements in you know, the local papers and magazines and um doing radio campaigns. And so the, you know, local sports radio would, would be having little Sully's commercials, you know, during games or in, in, uh, during their programming. So Sully started to become its own brand and, you know, has just, like I said earlier in the, in our conversation, it just kind of coexisted with bridge nine for at now for over 20 years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And it's a, it's the real deal. I mean, you're partnered with Target, right? Yep. You got some t-shirts to Ben Affleck somehow, and we see him wearing Bridge Nine t-shirts or Sully's brand t-shirts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's been very, very cool. So Ben Affleck's, um, he has, so he used a lot of our t-shirts in that movie, The Town, um, that came out, that was filmed in Boston and filmed at Fenway Park. Um, you know, there were, there were scenes where he was wearing our Believe in Boston shirts Oh, we had this Irish pub uh, boxing shirt that Jeremy Renner wore. Um, Slane wore one of our shirts in, in one of the scenes. So there was, you know, multiple Sully's brand designs in that film. And when it came out, it was, I mean, it was like Christmas. It was, we, it was, the, everyone wanted those shirts and we were able to sell them to stores and online and it was very cool. So when the COVID happened and everything was starting to shut down, it was right around the time of the 10th anniversary of the town having come out in theaters. So I just, I sent a care package to Ben Affleck thanking him like, Hey, it's, it's been 10 years, which is wild. Thank you very much for including us in your film. You know, we still greatly appreciate that. And, uh, I threw, you know, a few of our kind of current Sully's Boston centric shirts in, in the package and I didn't hear from him, but all of a sudden they started popping up and he started wearing them, which was very, very cool. And every time he wore them, you know, we, it wasn't crazy, but we sell 15 or 20 of them that day. And, you know, when, whenever these paparazzi photos would pop up. Um, so when everything else for us was shut down during COVID, that was a little lifeline for us, which was uh, very cool. And then fast forward to the spring of uh, last year, 2021, uh, we started hearing that Ben Affleck was going to be fi uh, filming a movie in the, in our area, kind of in the, in the, in Massachusetts. And, coincidentally it turned out they were filming a movie next door to our new building so we get bumped from our building that we had then so uh, just for timeline purposes when we we left boston we moved to salem we shared an office for four years with death wish and kind of tried to recreate what had happened at Inatech when we were with big wheel and hydrahead and then after four years we moved one town in, to the east and they moved one town to the west and we kind of existed in, in these different towns for about 14 years and then we came to beverly where death wish had moved um we're actually just a couple streets over from them now and this movie it was uh it's called the tender bar that was uh george a george clooney film they basically looked at 30 different bars to be the you know this kind of the, the setting of this this film and they chose the one that was one door next to us. So, you know, we got the keys to this new building on a Friday. And then on Monday, I get a phone call from this, the location scout for the movie and to find out it's like this Ben Affleck film. And this is after him repping our brand for a year, which was 
obviously very cool, but like, what are the, what are the odds that that would happen? Um, it's crazy, right? Yeah. It's, it's in, in moving to this building was such a leap for me. You know, it was, I was, um, I had my smallest staff as a label, you know, we had had to let a few people go during COVID and we weren't putting out new records at the moment. So we, we, we were just, it was just a skeleton crew. And now all of a sudden I had to kind of uproot 14 years of, of our home and, and move to a new space. But like we moved to the dingiest, dirtiest spot that I could afford that we could basically uh, renovate and make cool. Right. So like when I moved into this space, it looked like it hadn't been updated in 50 years. It, the, the whole building was, uh, had been neglected. So I'm standing there like with the keys just moved in, uh, not even moved in, just, just, just got, just let myself in. Right. Like I still, everything was still at the old space and I'm like, Oh my God, what did I, what did I get into? Right. Like this is such a leap. And then I get this phone call. And, you know, finding out that this Ben Affleck film is, you know, wants to use our building, um, not only as kind of background for one of the scenes, they turned our, they turned this building into like a Kodak, like the photo developing studio that was, you know, kind of from the seventies era. Um, but they also used it for their COVID testing and for their, all their extras to be kind of housed while they were doing the movie. And, you know, all the street signs that were like the modern things that they had to remove from the streets uh, for this kind of late seven, late seventies set film, they threw into our space. Do you get paid for that? We did. Yeah. I mean, it was nothing crazy. And I, I probably could have negotiated it better, but I was just like, wait, Ben Affleck wants to, you know, after, after everything else, I was like, this seems crazy. Yeah, of course. Like whatever, like, you know, you just you give me whatever. And I think it covered the first month of our, our mortgage. So it was nothing crazy, but it was cool. But it, it, for more importantly, it was almost like the universe saying, you made the right decision. Those are the best moments. Yeah. It, it, I was, there was so much doubt, like, oh my God, what did we just commit to? And, and, and then having this opportunity was like, okay, all right, maybe I'm going down the right direction. And so far it's been cool. I mean, it's I, the last year and a half of kind of finding our space and building it and like getting ready. And, you know, we just opened our record store a month ago. So it's, that was a very long process and there's still so, so much to do here. But at least it felt like, okay, we're, we're going in the right direction. Well, more importantly, is Ben going to use your shirts in the movie again? <laughs> you know, I, we'll see. But I know that um, – so I, I actually had the opportunity to meet him when they filmed the scene and thank him for, for repping our brand. And he was very cool about it. But after I spoke with him, his assistant came over and she was like, hey, are you the Sully's guy? And I was like, yeah. I was like, <laughs> yeah. She's like – well, he, you know, Ben loves your shirts. We should do a shirt together. So I was like, all right, well, what, what do you want to do? And so when films wrap, they usually, you know, some of the bigger stars in the film will give like a gift to everyone that worked on the, on the film. And, you know, so it's usually something like, I don't know, like, like a t-shirt. So basically we designed a shirt that was themed around the bar uh, that was featured in the film. And then um, had his signature, like said, like, thanks, Ben, you know, on the inside of the shirt. Um, over kind of about where the, the tag would be. And they printed, I don't know, four or 500 of them and, and distributed them to every single person that had some hand in the film, whether they were, you know, uh, a lighting person or, you know, costume department or, you know, someone behind a camera. Um, so that was kind of a, kind of a cool full circle moment for us. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. And that's a great sign from the universe that you're you're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Are you aware, Chris, that tomorrow, October 18th, is Caspian Day in Beverly, Massachusetts? You know, I um, I know today is Edge Day, um, but I did, not, <laughs> I did not realize that that tomorrow is Caspian Day. I know they're a big deal here in Beverly, um, and I've I've they've been in I'm, I'm like in a cert, like kind of a, a similar orbit. Um, we don't directly overlap necessarily, but um, I know that they're that they are a cool band. And you know, it's funny. We actually had a, I think a band that's a little more in their orbit is Cave In. They filmed a music video uh, in our in our warehouse um, last year, and actually, or, I'm sorry, earlier this year, and uh, it came out this past summer, which was which was kind of cool for us to you know as like the space that was still being worked on. Um, 
the guy that was directing the video that they were shooting, um, I guess they had an, another music video, uh, another space, like this kind of old warehouse space that they were trying to use and it fell through and they were in a pinch. So he reached out to me and said, hey, he had been following the progress in our, our warehouse and said, hey, I, 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 th- I think I saw that you had kind of like a shitty warehouse. Like, is it still shitty or have you like read it? <laughs> And I was like, we've only been focusing on the basement. The back is still shitty in the warehouse. Um, so they ended up coming and spending the day and filming a music video for their new album, which was which was which was pretty cool. That is awesome. Great band, classic band, incredible. And for you know, it was that my favorite part of it was I worked on some Cave In stuff when that uh, I think it was around when Jupiter came out because I was working at Big Wheel, um, but I was really working for Lumberjack Distribution um, mm-hmm. and. And Hydrahead was part of of that equation as well. So some of their releases, I was helping with the marketing for for Hydrahead releases and also for Big Wheel releases and, and some Doghouse releases at the time. And um, and so Caven was part of of that world back then. I and mean, this is going back, you know, over twenty years when they were filming the the video. Um, like I'm kind of an archivist. I keep everything, and you have to be when you're the label person. Um, you kind of have to kind of keep all the the parts and and everything from releases that you've worked on. And, and I kept all of my mail order from the nineties and had a letter, you know, from, uh, it's from, from someone in cave in that was, and I was able to like bring it to the, um, like bring it out during the, the recording. And in the, uh, the letter, there was a fanzine that he had included that he had done. And, um, it had, uh, it's from Steve Brodsky and in, it, he had, uh, an interview with Bain and Pete Chilton from Bain was one of the camera people. He was actually the person that helped connect using our space for, for the, sh- for the shoot. And there was, uh, like all, all of us were in the, the same kind of, uh, equation now, you know, in 2022, but we were also a part of the same equation in like 1997 when he mailed me this thing, you know, to my, like my parents' address. Everything comes full circle. It does. So I bring up a Caspian Day in Beverly, Massachusetts, because I have an idea. Okay, today is Edge Day, 1017. Tomorrow is Caspian Day, 1018. 1019, Sully's Day, Beverly, Massachusetts. What do you think? You know, I think Sully's needs its own day. I don't know if it'll be uh, 1019, but I need to look into that, see if the, the city can give us a proclamation or something. Yeah, so if the powers that be in Beverly are listening to this, I mean, come on. What says Boston and Massachusetts and Beverly more than Sully's? I can't think of anything. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, it's it's been wild for us to, again, for for us having these two separate brands between Sully's and, and Bridge Nine co- coexisting for so many years, but but not people not really really realizing it, and then for us to now have this very public um, facing retail space that showcases both brands. Like it's, it's been very cool. And I, it's something that makes sense. I think here probably wouldn't make sense in, in other cities. Certainly I, I know that punk and, and hardcore and, and sports don't really mix in a lot of places, but uh, you know, maybe Philly, I think we could, we could do something like this in Philly. 100%. There's many similarities, many similarities. It would work. Yeah. So let's talk about what we've got coming up. We have the new storefront, We've got half uh, Bridge Nine storefront, half Solis, so we can check out records. We can pick up some Solis gear. Do we have access to you, Chris? Can we pick your brain about the label and and talk about the old days and the new days? Oh, absolutely. In fact, that's been one of the best parts about it. Like, you know, maybe a year from now, I'll I'll regret saying it, but it's been it's been really nice uh, being there. Um, You know, I'm I'm here, you know, pretty much at all times, anyways. Um, to be able to meet up with people and, and, you know, just talk about music, talk about bands. Um, before we even opened, there was a guy that kind of showed up. I was, I was painting some of the record bins, you know, it was like a few, I think it was like 10 days before we opened the store and I was, I was doing some painting, kind of touching things up. And this guy starts, walks up to the, uh, the front door and he's kind of peering in, you know, with his hand over his eyes, kind of like, you know, over his you know forehead, kind of looking in. And I walked over and he's wearing a have heart shirt. And it turns out he was just someone that was from, I think from out of state and was in the area for a wedding and knew that it was close to where Bridge Nine store was opening. So he just wanted to take a peek. And I just walked over, invited him in. We ended up, him and his wife came in. We talked for 
you know, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. Um, and we have this have heart last show kind of use air quotes cause it was from 2009, uh, from the cover of the live album that we did for that, that show. And he, put, he like, he was in the picture. So he's like, Hey, that's me. And like went and pointed himself out in this picture. So I have a photo of him now in a half heart shirt pointing to himself, you know, 10 years ago, or actually 12, 13 years ago at this point, you know, uh, at their, what was their last show at the time. So it's been cool. I mean, I, I've, I've learned, you know, that a lot of people that have followed the label, um, our bands have been, you know, a part of their life during very pivotal times. So being in a place where now people can come to, to this, the, the label store and label headquarters and connect with people that have been fans for, for a long time has been, has been very cool. I love that. That sounds great. And do you have any uh, new or upcoming releases on the label that you want to highlight? Yeah. So we, we just signed a band from New York City called Roll Call. You know, we just put up their six song EP, their, their first recording, um, just went online. So it's, you can listen to it now. You know, the, the EP is called Perpetuate. It's, uh, it's six songs. And so if, if anyone's interested in seeing what we're up to, I mean, for a little while, there was a lot of questions like, is Bridge Nine still an active label? You know, what are we, what are we up to? And obviously like our release schedule was scaled back during COVID and, and then during our move, I didn't want to commit to bands because I didn't know if I had the resources. Cause during this, this move, there was multiple times where we were encountering this, these crazy, um, obstacles in, in our build out. You know, we found structural issues with the building that we had to address. Um, we've had to bring certain parts of the building up to code that, uh, because the last person that was here had been here for almost 50 years, they just never had to make these improvements. So we kind of had to shoulder that. And these are things that I didn't, you know, I didn't really know or budget for um, because I was doing a lot of this on my own uh, strategizing how I was going to make this transition. I've had some really great help. I always have to give a shout out to Larry Kelly. Uh, He's a carpenter um, and uh, someone who's been involved in the Boston hardcore and punk scene for, for decades that, has been instrumental in helping me kind of make this space a reality, but there was no advisory board. You know, it was just like, we got to find a place. I found a spot that I thought would work and jumped on it and then realized, Oh wait, you know, we have to jump through all these additional hoops to be able to open to the public. You know, we have to be ADA compliant, which we want to be, but you know, we realized, Oh, in order to do that, we have to, dig up our driveway and lower, you know, the driveway to be the right grade for handicap accessibility, all things that we did. Um, but these are things that you don't budget for when you're sometimes when you're making a move like this. Yeah. There's a lot of unknowns, especially when it comes to construction and building codes and city codes and all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It was that, that was a learning experience for sure. Well, Chris, this was awesome. And I want to say thanks for coming on the show. I mean, you've done so much you're doing so much. I'm looking forward to more from the label. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, Keith, thank you very much for the opportunity to chat with you and let people know what we've been up to and, you know, kind of what we're, what we're doing, where we're going. And there you have it, Chris Ren, really nice guy, really great conversation. Glad I had the opportunity to speak to him. He had a lot of great stories about the label. And, you know, I liked hearing those stories because I wasn't completely active in hardcore during that time. I was off busy with my own band, my first band. I was listening to a lot of post rock and post hardcore and that kind of stuff. So to hear about it firsthand from Chris, who was at the head of it all was great to hear about those stories at Fenway Park selling shirts. And just imagining Wes and other people from other bands out there selling shirts. is It's funny. It's, it must have been a great time. And uh, I wish him continued success with Sully's brand. Really awesome. Thank you once again, Chris, for coming on the show. So let's check in, huh? How are we doing? I had an unbelievably busy weekend that I was fearing, but I got through it in one piece And here we go. Friday, I saw Soft Kill at Music Hall of Williamsburg. Now, I was at a thing at like 7 p.m. Friday night, 
and I'm looking at Twitter because I'm bored and I see soft kill posts and they say, we're playing at 1115 PM. And I was like, oh shit. What? Uh, look, it's uncomfortable for me to be at gigs and I'll get into that more in a second, but I didn't want to stand. I couldn't physically stand through three opening bands on my feet for three hours and 15 minutes waiting for soft kill to go on. So I was like, I can't go. I can't. Uh, am I going to be able to go to the show? I don't know if I can go to the show. It's so late, but I just killed time until the gig. And then I went there with my friend and we got there. Soft kill was setting up within five minutes and I saw the show and it was great. So here's the thing. I think I think I am a magnet for the most annoying people at shows, no matter what show I go to, no matter where I stand, no matter what I do, the most obnoxious people will end up directly in front of my face. Now, I'm watching Soft Kill. There's a good 20 feet of space in front of me, right? This guy, probably the biggest guy in the venue, ends up two inches in front of my face, dancing and flailing around. I look to my left at my friend Jonathan, who I went to the gig with, nobody in front of him. I look to my right, nobody there, just me, just this gigantic guy directly in front of my face for the whole gig. I take a couple steps back, he takes a couple steps back. I take a step back into the right, he takes a step back into the right. So this is my curse, I guess. But hey, soft kill was great. You know, I wanted to make sure that I saw this show because I don't think they're going to be back for another couple years, according to what Tobias was saying. He's taking some time off. And it was funny, during the last song of Soft Kill, they just stopped playing pretty close to the beginning of the song. And I was like, what's going on? I look up front and there's a fight between two guys. And it took them a minute to get them out of there. And then some guy yells out, who gets in a fight at a post-punk show? (laughs) That was funny. Everybody laughed. But I thought it was cool that Soft Kill just stopped. Tobias saw the fight, turned to the drummer and was like, eh, cut it. And they just stopped until the fight stopped and they got the guys out of there. And even while they were getting them out of there, Tobias says into the mic, well, this is a first. So fighting at a post-punk gig? Come on. I mean, what are we doing? That's the first time I've seen a fight at a show in a long time. I think people just get drunk and out of control. You know, even when I was leaving the venue, there was just very drunk, aggro people. Some guy kept making some annoying sound, and then this other guy was like telling him to shut the fuck up and giving him the finger. It's just people get nuts when they drink. Saturday, another gig, a veil and dead guy at Irving Plaza. Now, I was looking forward to this because I've never seen dead guy. I didn't think I was going to catch any of the reunions because of logistics. And, you know, I just I didn't think I was going to get to see them. And a veil, I didn't get to see their entire set at Furnace Fest, because I didn't get to see a lot of entire fests at Furnace Fest because there was so much crossover. You're running from one stage to another to try to catch every band. So this was going to be a good time. Went to the gig, saw Dead Guy. They were excellent. The set list was perfect. It was, you know, I recognized all, all or most of the songs. Fantastic. Next up was the Suicide Machines. Now, I had never heard or seen the Suicide Machines. I kind of knew their deal, the ska punk thing. And I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised. They put on a fantastic show. People were super into it. They had like straightaway punk songs. They had punk ska songs. People were really into it. They People were doing that like ska circle pit dance, which, you know, everyone just looked like they were having a good time. It was fun. I dug it. So now I'm primed to watch a veil and they're setting up and the music starts. And that guy that they have with them comes out on stage, Bobo, I think, Bo one of those. And the music starting, I'm pumped. And Bobo spits into the audience. And not like a little one. I'm talking like a big, nasty, you know, spit. And I said, fuck this. And I walked all the way to the back. I'm not trying to get spit on. That's disgusting. I'm sorry. And then I'm in the back looking at them and the guy spits into the audience again. And look, I love a veil. I love Tim Barry. I've had him on the show. It's one of my favorite episodes of the show. But dude, you can't spit into the audience, you know, and call me old, out of touch, lame. I don't care. You enjoy getting spit on you. You're telling me you enjoy getting spit on. You know, imagine you're a young kid in the audience and you get a big 
spit in your face or imagine that you're older and you get finally get a babysitter for the kids and you get out to the show and you pay for parking and you get in there and you get spit on. It's not cool. I'm not into it. I'm sorry. Besides that, Avail were fantastic. Great show. And I was at the show with my friend Brendan. He sings for the band Scurvy. Remember them? Remember the pirate-themed hardcore band? I think they had a release or two on Stillborn Records. And I was with him and his friend Sean, who I met. Really great. It's always good to be at a gig with friends, you know, because I, I've gone to so many shows alone because I don't know as many people up here in New York or Brendan I hadn't seen in years, five years or something. So it was really great to see him again. Same thing at the Avail show. I'm a magnet for annoying people. During Dead Guy, there's this guy in front of me. And after each Dead Guy song, he leans his head all the way back, one centimeter from my face, to yell to Dead Guy. And he was doing the same thing during the other bands, too. I look to my left. Brendan and Sean don't have anybody in front of them. They got a good 10 inches in front of them. I look to my right. Everybody there is fine. I've got this guy one centimeter from my face, and he's with this girl wearing a backpack. And she's backing into me. The backpack is rubbing against my chest. And then she's looking back at me like I'm doing something wrong. You know, the amount of spatial unawareness of these people at a gig in New York City is really offensive to me personally. You would think people would be more aware. You would think they would be more courteous, but you would be wrong. So Sunday was the big iodine gig. We had one line drawing. We had Joe McMahon of Smoker Fire. We had Her Heads on Fire and Bear Child open. Now, I didn't get there until Her Heads on Fire because I was doing something else, but it turns out my friend Justin, Bear Child is his band. I hadn't seen Justin in years since pre-COVID. He comes up to me at the show. He's like, hey, it's me. And I was like, uh, I didn't even remember him at first. And then turns out he also plays keys in Judas Knife. And he's in Light Tower too, I'm pretty sure. So unfortunately, I missed Bear Child, but it was great to see Justin. Her heads on fire were awesome. Always enjoy seeing them. That first song that they opened the set with is my favorite. I forget the name of it, but I closed the show with it last time uh, Joe was on the show. Awesome band. I know it's on the full length. I think it's the, actually, I think it's the last song on the full length. Go listen to that. It's good. Joe McMahon of Smoke or Fire, one of my favorite interviews. Got to chat with him for a while. Really nice guy. I'm watching him on stage. And he'll be like, this song was about this, and this song was about that. And then I remember Joe talking about those very things to me on the show. Just seeing everything come full circle was really cool. And the guy is just so good. It, you know, like, I still have this perception in my mind of like, oh, I'm going to see a solo artist. It's not going to be that good. You know, one guy in an acoustic guitar. He killed it. He killed it. It was so good. And my favorite song I saw him perform was All Went Black. It's a sadder song. It killed me in a great way. It was really good. He's got an acoustic version of it on his band camp. Trust me, you want to listen to this. And then finally, Jonah, one line drawing. The guy is a professional. He killed it as well. I had never seen one line drawing before. I heard everything I wanted to hear. He played really here by far. He played all the classics. He closed it out with lukewarm. The guy's a pro, man. The guy's a pro. I loved it. I got to have a little conversation with him as well. I'm very happy that I went to this show. You know, it's always nice to meet artists who I talk to on the show because when I record the show, they, you, they can't see me. I can't see them. I'm just a voice. So it's nice to, you know, and a lot of these people I've listened to for most of my life. So really great time at the show. Very nice to meet everybody. So that brings me to my next topic. It was a lot of shows. It was a lot of shows, and it was very tiring. And listen, uh, I want to I wanna play something first before I make my announcement. And if you're a Howard Stern listener, you're going to be very familiar with this clip. Now, I know I've given the Beatles a hard time on our social media and on the show, but this clip I'm about to play is recorded by one of the Beatles. It's the best 40 seconds of audio ever recorded, and it's by a Beatle, so... Props to them for that. Here it is. This is a serious message to everybody watching my update right now. Peace and love. Peace and love. I want to tell you, please, after 
the 20th of October. Do not send fan mail to any address that you have. Nothing will be signed after the 20th of October. If that has a date on the envelope, it's going to be tossed. I'm warning you with peace and love, but I have too much to do. So no more fan mail. Thank you. Thank you. And no objects to be signed. Nothing. Uh, anyway, peace and love, peace and love. Okay. For, that clip is brilliant for so many reasons, but putting out a video on YouTube or his website or wherever he put it to say that, you know, if you send any fan mail past this date, I'm going to throw it out. That's hilarious. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And warning somebody with peace and love, I'm warning you with peace and love. I can't get over that. Like I say that all the time in my head and it's just hilarious. But this brings me to my own announcement. Okay, peace and love, peace and love. This is a message to everybody listening to this podcast. After the 31st of October, do not send me any more invites to go to any more shows, gigs, concerts. The invites will be tossed. I'm warning you with peace and love, but I have too much to do. I can't stand up for three hours at a clip anymore. I don't want to get spit on by people on stage. It's too late. I'm too tired. I can't do it anymore. So do not send me any invites, nothing. It will be tossed. So that's it. No more gigs for a long time. Unless it's some kind of VIP seated arrangement type thing, then maybe we can work it out, but still probably not. If you want to meet up for a coffee or a quick meal or something, that would be preferred. But that's it. No more. Anyway, uh, peace and love, peace and love. Goodbye. I I just don't think I enjoy going to shows anymore. I'm 40 years old now. I can't stand up for that long. I can't be up that late. It's really hard to be around drunk, obnoxious people. I don't want to get spit on. I, I it hurts too. It it it's painful. I wish I enjoyed it still, but I don't. And it kicks up a lot of things. When I came home from the gig Saturday night, it wasn't that late. And I was kind of depressed about being older and not being able to stay out all night like I used to and just going wild at gigs and all this stuff. And my fucked up brain, I started thinking, oh, you should do drugs again. You should do drugs again. Then you'll stay up all night. You'll be out all night and you'll be like you used to. And I was like, wait, no, that sounds like a horrible idea. So it puts me into a bad headspace. And I don't know. I, I just find myself not having fun at shows anymore. I'm sorry to say it, but that's what happens. And, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine last night and she brought up something that I didn't even think about. She said that COVID has changed things as well. Like she used to enjoy going to gigs before COVID and we're in post COVID. Well, COVID is still going on, but it's not the same anymore. And that's how I feel too. Up until the shutdown, I would go to gigs often by myself. And still mostly have fun, I guess, most of the time. It still wasn't that fun to go alone, but I would always still go. And I don't want to do it at all anymore. And I think a lot of people are in that mindset. I think lockdown has really changed everything. I know it has for me. I don't want to go to shows as much anymore. I don't want to go to anything as much anymore. And I know I've heard musicians on the show talk about this as well and just say, like, there's not as many people out at gigs. Will that change? Will that ever go back to normal? I don't know. I don't know. And I remember in early shutdown, someone said, I read something somewhere on social media. Someone's like, oh, things are going to be different forever. And I got so mad at that. I was like, oh, shut up. It's it's not going to last long. It's Everything's going to go back to normal. I think I was upset because I couldn't handle the reality of what was going on and the possibility that things would never be the same again. But it looks like that's the case for right now at least. So that's it. No more gigs. But I hope everyone out there is having a great Halloween. Last year, I said I was going to watch Halloween, Halloween 2, and Halloween 2016, and I ended up not watching any of them. So I'm going to set a much more reasonable goal this year. I'm going to watch Halloween Part 1. That's it. I'm going to watch Halloween Part 1, and I'll give kids candy that knock on my door. I get a couple trick-or-treaters every year. I'll probably get a couple more since I have a light outside that actually works now. And before I conclude this episode of The New Scene, I would like to pay tribute to the almighty 
Ink and Dagger. It would not be Halloween if we did not mention Ink and Dagger. Now, if you are unfamiliar with this band, they are from Philadelphia. They came together from members of Crud as a Cult and Mandela Strike Force. Mandela Strike Force had Sean McCabe and Don DeVore, and then they ran with those ideas and made Ink and Dagger. It started out as kind of a swizz DC punk type sound, and they dressed as vampires. They said that they were vampires that fed off the energy of the crowd. There was a lot of antics. Those early shows are legendary strobe lights, makeup, stakes, coffins, throwing blood at the crowd, you name it. Uh, They got away from the vampire shtick and still continued to make unbelievably great music. The sound changed, but each album is different, but each album is great. You know, I think with each Ink and Dagger full length, you get something very special. You can't go wrong with any of it, really. The early stuff, again, kind of sounds like Swizz and that type of stuff. The middle record is like an extension of that, but fine-tuned. And the final posthumous record is more of a heavier shoegaze sound. The seven inches are all great. The singles are all great. Make sure you go check it out. I first saw them live around the time Fine Art of Original Sin came out. I think it was 98, 1998. Yeah. And I had heard all the stories and all the hype about the band and they did not disappoint. I'll never forget that show. It was the only time that I saw them. I wish I could have seen more of them, but but I didn't. And uh, Sean McCabe, the vocalist, tragically died in, I think it was the year 2000 or 2001. I really would have liked to hear more from him. I really would have liked to hear more from the band. I'm very curious about the band and the people in it. I'm always asking about stories from back in the day. You've probably heard me ask guest questions about them before. The, the lore and all the antics and everything behind the band is something of great interest to me. So yes, around Halloween time, I always think of Ink and Dagger. I always listen to Ink and Dagger. I'll always go back into a deep dive looking at YouTube videos and reading whatever articles are out there. Great, legendary band. I have two tattoos, and one of them is an Ink and Dagger tattoo. So rest in peace, Sean McCabe, and long live Ink and Dagger and the Philadelphia Society of Future Vampires. Thanks, everybody, for listening. and. Until next time.